to the NPTEL lecture series on animal physiology. So, we are in section 6 about the blood cells, immunity and the clotting. So, we initiated with the red blood cells in the first section and then in the second section I bypassed the white blood cells and moved on to the platelets and the clotting factors. So, today what I will do, I will tell some of the basics. Now, since you have fairly good idea about what blood is, about some of the basics what uh, whenever you go to a doctor and the doctor ask you to get a blood sample and, and a blood testing and what you see in the sheet. So, you know the doctor takes the blood or the compounder takes the blood and then it is being processed and next evening or the same day or after some time you see a report. So, what that report really says and how you can interpret that report, this is very important for you people to understand. Okay. This is a practical aspect of it and next thing what we will be doing, I promised you that I will be covering how these different blood cells are formed, how this whole differentiation process, how a one single cell. So, let me rephrase this sentence essentially blood is formed from one single form of you can call it a pluripotent or a stem cell or something of that, that kind. So, from one source it all divides some forms following a different pathway red blood cells, some forms white blood cells, some form platelets, how that whole thing happens. Okay. And one more thing, well the, uh, in my last class while I was teaching you about the platelets, I made a small mistake is correct it. I talked to you about the thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are not actually the platelets of the of the human being or mammal, it is for the non mammalian. So, the thrombocytes are those. So, just a slight error basically platelets are formed from mega karyocytes. I will come to that today. Okay. Just correct that small error which I made in my previous uh, class on, on the clotting aspect. Okay. So, talking about the blood what a doctor does when doctor asks you to uh, do a blood analysis. So, blood is a fluid that we all know now, by this time we know that it is flowing all over the body and fluid has lot of particles and those particles could be cells. We have talked about red blood cells which are carrying the oxygen, then we talked about the platelets, they are also small teeny tiny particle of 4 micron uh, kind of a major diameter or it is kind of a triangular shape. So, you cannot call it a major diameter, it is kind of if you take the maximum length of that triangle, the kind of the base of the triangle then probably it will be around 4 micron and those are non nucleated. Same way the red blood cells are non nucleated, they do not have any nucleus apart from I talked about the platelets that is where the thrombocytes come. Thrombocytes are the platelets of the non mammalian system, which indeed have nucleus in them. Okay. So, we are not going to deal with the, those thrombocytes, okay. we will be only dealing with the platelets which are in the human system. So, and then you have the third cell type which is white blood cells, the cells for immunity, the macrophages. Uh, we talked about the macrophages while we talked about how the red blood cells which live their lifetime of say 120 days or 110 days kind of rejected out of the body how they are being engulfed by the white blood cells is macrophages. So, the micro macrophages if you do something called a blood smear. So, what essentially is blood smear is that say for example, on my tip I just prick it and get a drop of blood and make a smear. So, you take the drop of blood and put it in a glass cover slip and you just you know spread it like this. Just like you have a drop of water you do it like this, like look at my hand and if this is the glass cover slip you just a smear it. And if you look at the smear then there are several kind of one second excuse me. So, if you look at under the microscope, you will see three distinct features. One you will see I told you about this platelet cells, which do not have any nucleus. So, if you add any nuclear stain, you would not find any nuclear staining on them. Then you will find some cells, which are circular biconcave kind of cells, which also do not have any nucleus. Those are your red blood cells. So, there may be some red blood cell in the phase of formation which also does not have any nucleus, yet you will find a kind of cell or a series of such cells, which will have multiple nucleus connected to each other, which are multinucleated. Those multinucleated cells are your white blood cells. 
So, if I had to draw this, the classification of it, it will look something like this. On a blood smear, you will see. So, if this is your glass, then and if you are looking at a smear, you will see something like this. And then you will see something like this. It you will see a huge, huge cells with something like this. Okay. Okay. So now look at this. And going by the dimensions, if you look at it, these huge cells which I am now circling in red, these are your WBCs. these one which I put it in green are the platelets and the one I am now putting in yellow are your RBCs. This is what you can see it under the microscope okay, in a blood smear. Yet, these are the cellular component, but your blood is fluid and what is the fluid component. So, if say just imagine and in that smear, if you have a very high resolution microscope, you can see proteins. Just imagine, for the imaginary sake, you cannot really see it under like that with the known technologies. Then you will see a series of such proteins, which are present there. And they are kind of floating in the fluid, which is mostly water. Okay. So, this watery fluid on which these proteins are suspended and the cell component are two different aspect. Okay. So, they are two different aspects of the blood. So, the blood essentially, if you, if you have some way, say for example, you take the blood sample in a, in a, in a tube like this, okay. just draw it for your visualization. So, say for example, yeah, I give you a tube like that and here you have filled with blood. Okay. So, this is all red is the blood. Okay. Okay. Now, if you one second, if you take this blood and you spin it at certain rpm, okay. you put it in a centrifuge and spin it. After some time, what will you will see after you spinning, spin it down. This is what you are going to see. This is spinning or centrifugation is done to separate out components within a fluid. Okay. So, what you will essentially see the fluid component remains at the top and the cellular component or the solid component comes at the bottom. There will be separation and separation will look pretty much like this. So, what you will see is lot of solid component here and here you have a lot of fluid component. This fluid component which you separate out is called plasma and this cellular component all is this we can call it a cellular component or it is technically it is called formed elements. And this formed elements are nothing but what I showed you here. These are the formed elements WBCs, RBCs, and platelets. So, now put the name for that formed elements. And if I have to do a volume percentage ratio for this, these formed elements are around 37 to 54 percent, that is the constitution constituent of the formed element. Whereas, the plasma component out here, this plasma component varies from 46 to 63 percent. Now, I talk to you about the different formed elements. Okay. Now, I will talk to you about the different proteins which are present there and these proteins are essentially called plasma proteins. So, that formed uh, the plasma component consists of protein elements. So, which you can imagine as if cell is a bigger particle, which 
So, protein is a micro nanoparticle. Okay. So, macroscopic particle at the micron range and you have a nanoparticle. So, those nanoparticles remain suspended in the fluid and the fluid consists of lot of electrolytes. So, plasma can be now put into two component, plasma protein component, plasma electrolyte component. Okay. So, that is what we will do. Now, let us classify the plasma, okay. plasma into two parts. One part is called plasma proteins. This plasma protein, the major contribution is made by albumin. Albumin, you all of you are aware of that in the, this is one of the major egg protein. Okay. You see that in the egg, you have this albumin protein, bovine serum albumin and all these albumin. So, albumin is one of the major chunk, which is approximately almost I think around 60 percent of albumin. Apart from albumin, in the clotting, I highlighted that you, ha you will be needing fibrinogen. Okay. So, fibrinogen is another component, which is present there. Then, let me enumerate them, albumin which is approximately 60 percent. Then you have globulin proteins, hemoglobulins that these are the globulin protein which constitute 35 percent. Then you have 4 percent of fibrinogen and you have a bunch of enzyme, proenzyme, hormones. So, which essentially falls under regulatory proteins which is around less than 1 percent. Okay. So, this is pretty much the, the protein component which is involved in it. Okay. So, you have the huge chunk of the albumin, globulins, fibrinogen and a series of hormones and uh, proenzyme and everything. And this concentration of these different protein varies under different conditions of your body, different physiological status of your body different pathological status of your body. So, by looking at the blood sample, analysis of the blood sample could tell with what kind of technically speaking, one can predict cancer by very early diagnostics, but where is the problem? Why are we unable to detect it? This is the challenge. The reason we are unable to detect it lies in that last less than 1 percent regulatory protein, which I was telling you, all the hormones, enzymes, proenzymes and everything because it is exceptionally challenging to, you know, uh, I should say estimate proteins at a very low concentration. It is a big challenge, it is it's, it's enormously big challenge, because and what level is higher than normal is another challenge to figure out, because whenever cancer or any kind of pathological situation happens, it is not that those proteins, though they are already present in the body. But because of some x, y, z wrong situation, their level either goes up or goes down, but how to make that demarcation? Because already these proteins are present in proteins and enzymes are present in such a such a low concentration and they work at a, it is a very low concentration chemistry if you call about it. It is a very femto, nano, nano, femto likewise that molarity, at that molarity these things are working. So, at that concentration it is really, really tough and it is across the globe whether you talk about NIH United States, whether you talk about other uh, similar organizations in Europe, back home in India, all the places still blood always remain one of the hot subject of research. Could we analyze all the component and far more early before the uh, we reach to a point there is no point of no return that time you know you cannot treat the patient will die of that problem. Okay. So, could we diagnose it? Is there a way to diagnose? Is there a way to diagnose cancer way early? Is there a way to diagnose some uh, neurological disorder way early by just doing a blood sample? Could we predict? Do we have any mode? mode? How low we can detect? It is all about the detection limit and how accurately we could, we can detect, but what is the level of accuracy? That is very, very important. So, that is why I highlighted this, that was the reason why I wanted to highlight this point. Those less than 1 percent, do not neglect them, they are exceptionally important, because that is where lies all your diagnostic kits, diagnostic tools and everything. Okay. Now, let us move on to the other component of the plasma. So, we talked about all these smaller particle component, which are at the nano, not only at the nano, I mean like the, at the nano size domain, 
Now, let us talk about the pure elemental composition in the form of the electrolytes. Okay. Let us get back to the slides and one second. Okay. The, the other solutes include your electrolytes, which of course, you have sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfates likewise uh, 2 plus 2 plus oops, minus these are the series of electrolyte then you have the in this fragment you have the organic nutrients which includes your atp cholesterol so this is another one fatty acids then you have carbohydrate, you have amino acids likewise and then you have the organic waste it carries, which includes your urea, uric acid, creatinine, bilirubin, ammonium ion. Now, having enumerated this, I will request all of you, see whenever you get a blood profile check, what all the doctors can tell you. Doctors can tell you, get me the, uh, the possibilities, okay. the doctor can tell you, I wanted to see a blood cell profile. If the doctor asks for a blood cell profile, what are the possibilities? Either the RBC profile the doctor is asking or a WBC profile doctor is asking or a platelet profile doctor is asking. If the doctor is asking for a platelet profile, it means doctor has a suspicion about your clotting. Maybe there is excessive clotting or you know there is a lesser clotting. Maybe something related to hemophilia or blockage in somewhere in the vessels. If the doctors talks about WBCs, then it has something to do with immunity, fine. If the doctors talk to you about RBC, it has something to do with oxygen carrying capacity. Are you anemic or you are hyperactive or you are carrying more oxygen? Okay. So, look at it from one simple fluid, these are the three aspects. Now, if the doctor asks you, I want an uric acid profile or I want you to know what is the urea or ammonia that essentially means doctor is doubting you know how your kidney function is because urea and uric acid this is all secreted by the by the through the kidney okay now if the doctor ask get me the potassium profile this is very interesting when the doctor ask for potassium profile doctor may suspect that you may have a some clotting problem because if you remember i was telling you that potassium plays a very critical role in all kind of clotting mechanism okay if the doctor asks you that I want like uh, you know profiles like uh, electrolyte profile, the doctor is may suspect that you know your electrolyte exchange is being compromised. Then doctor may ask you, I want a lipid profile. This is also doctors will ask you. Just give you a give a blood sample, we'll get a lipid profile. Then the doctors are aware of, uh, is your cholesterol is within control? or is the good cholesterol and proportion of good and the bad cholesterol are they balanced to balanced in an optimal zone or you are at the danger zone you are at the susceptible zone for heart attacks or any kind of other disorders okay they may ask for a lipid profile so look at it from one blood sample you can predict almost i just i mean randomly i could tell you at least 50 different situations which could happen in your body because always realize whenever you study physiology always it is a very holistic thing. This whole blood is flowing all over your body. It is not only picking up the, the element which it has to throw away from the body the organic waste. It is also circulating the important compounds which the body needs for its growth, survival and maintaining the homeostasis as well as hemostasis. Hemostasis is the clotting and homeostasis is the complete balance of the body. Okay. So, that is why blood analysis and blood sampling is so, so, so very important. 
doctor first thing doctor will say okay or if the doctor suspect diabetes okay. i want the fasting sugar non fasting sugar okay so so try to look through look through any of those prescription uh, like the blood reports and see on one column you will see what the what the analysis has told you on the other column they will see this is the control this is the maximum allowed minimum allowed zone and this is the normal zone and then you have to correlate where your value falls in terms of you know the blood cell count or carbohydrate urea whatsoever then doctor may tell you i want a bilirubin profile or the bilirubin concentration that's why doctor is basically essentially indicating doctor is suspecting you suffer from jaundice you know so these are some of the things which uh, a blood analysis can tell you and that's why after giving you some bit of an introduction about the blood uh, red blood cells and the platelets i came to this topic that will help you to appreciate why are we studying it in in depth now what i will do after covering this part of the basic uh, the whole idea of blood testing and diagnostics and everything what i will do i'll move on to the way the blood cells are formed so i will try to cover it in one slide with a pictorial representation how within the bone marrow from one single cell type all the different cell types are getting differentiated the leftmost column will be talking about the red blood cells now we'll be talking about the white blood cells then we'll be talking about the the platelets okay so in a one slide this is how i'm i'm planning that that will take care of all your doubts how these are being formed okay so let's back to the slide and talk about the origin of the or or the basically the origin and differentiation of formed element okay origin and differentiation the process by which a cell attains its final fate differ in cation of the formed elements okay okay let's get back to it fine so it starts with something called hemocytoblast it's a huge cell though hmm. this is the nucleus okay hemo means blood hemo cytoblast this is the beginning point is in the blood marrow in the in the bone marrow okay hemocytoblast divides into two parts so hemocytoblast part of it form lymphoid stem cells lymphoid stem cell and part of it form myeloid stem cells myeloid stem cell i'll just put sc henceforth because that will help me easy so then these myeloid stem cells under the influence of factor called multi csf okay they form certain elements called and of course there are a few other molecules which are involved in it which is called erythropoietin epo erythropoietin erythropoietin okay the influence of epo some of these myeloid cells form the precursor cells for so this is the zone where we'll be talking about all the rbc formation so let me put it in red okay so these are the progenitor cells for the rbc this is an let me put it like this uh, rbc progenitor cell okay so this is where the rbc progenitor cells are forming then there is another series of progenitor cells from myeloid they are forming i'm putting them in green pro geni progenitor cells these progenitor cells form something called 
mega karyocyte and these mega karyocytes are cells like this huge huge cells like this okay so what i will do before i come back to the right side like all the all the lymphoid stem cells and all other things what i will do i will just talk about these two elements i'm just putting them in these two elements we will talk about first, otherwise it will become very complex. Okay. We will talk about these two elements, the what is happening here. So, let us first of all talk about what is happening to the RBC progenitor cells. Okay. So, we start with after the, so the first series of cells are called pro erythroblast. This pro erythroblast reached into erythroblast stage. Erythroblast is the other name for the RBC. Erythroblast, okay. And from here it forms something called reticulocyte. And reticulocyte is the phase when it starts losing the nucleus, which you remember I was showing in the first class how they are losing the nucleus because of 15 lipoxygenase activity. So, this is the zone where the reticulocyte is the stage when from erythroblast to reticulocyte formation, this is the stage when there is a sharp peak within the cytoplasm of 15 lipoxygenase enzyme, which I have already discussed in the first class. And because of that 15 lipoxygenase enzyme, all the different cell organelles and the nucleus completely gets damaged. So, the cell is only filled with hemoglobin molecule, which helps for rest of its life of 120 days to carry oxygen. Okay. From reticulocytes, what we get is essentially the RBCs. Okay. So, this is the pathway which is followed, which started with, if I had to summarize, it started with hemocytoblast, then you have myeloid stem cells from myeloid stem cells, because of the influence of erythropoietin. Some of these progenitor cells, these are the progenitor cells from pro erythroblast and pro erythroblast become erythroblast and then erythroblast becomes reticulocyte and that becomes RBC. Okay. So, we are done with one set of reactions, which leads to the formation of the RBCs. Now, what we will do? We will talk about the second one, which is the formation of the platelets or the clotting elements of the body. Okay. Let us get back to that. So, what is happening here? Okay. So, same again, starting with hemocytoblast, hemocytoblast to myeloid stem cell. The myeloid stem cells under the action of multi CSF, which is multi CSF stands for colony stimulating factor. Okay. This myeloid stem cells from a progenitor cell for progenitor cell for which are destined to become platelets. Okay. Progenitor cells for platelets and then they form a structure huge structure called mega karyocytes. Of course, the mega karyocyte has nucleus mind it. Okay. Mega karyocyte and this mega karyocyte then divides into small cells the platelets. So, this is the second route by the stimulation of the myeloid stem cells by a colony stimulating factor. These cells from a huge cells called mega karyocyte then mega karyocytes started fragmenting. They the basically as I told you, platelets are fragments of 
a bigger cell. They do not have any nucleus, at least in the mammalian system. In the non-mammalian, of course, in the thrombocytes, they do indeed have, but that's a totally different uh, mechanism, and we are not going to discuss this here. So these fragments of the cells form the platelets. Now we come to the the much bigger and the tougher one, which is how our immune cells are formed. Because as of now, we bypassed all that. Okay, we talked about RBCs, we talked about the platelets. Now let us get back to that whole hemocytoblast and we talked about the lymphoid stem cells and I have not talked about it. Now, I am going to talk about part of the lymphoid stem cells and part of the myeloid stem cells and how they are leading to the formation of the different white blood cells, which are almost five types okay, eosinophil, basophil, lymphocyte, leukocyte likewise. Okay. Let us get into that. So, let us move on to the next slide. So, again we start with hemocytoblast. Now, let me use some other color, okay. hemocytoblast. So, I showed you the one classification on the uh, one division on the side, because they form lymphoid stem cell. Okay. Then lymphoid stem cells form something called lymphoblast. And lymphoblast forms something called prolymphocyte. And prolymphocyte forms lymphocytes. This is a one root. There are multiple roots, which I am coming to in the next. So, this is where all the lymphocytes are forms. So, white blood cells could be classified into two groups. One group which has the lymphoid lineage, they form from hemocytoblast to lymphoid cells and then through a cascade of uh, lymphoid stem cells to lymphoblast to prolymphoblast and reaching all the way to lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are further classification, which I will be coming soon lymphocytes could be you know, B cell, T cell likewise, I am not getting into that at this point. Okay. So, this is one root, which is the lymphoid root, but I showed you that this is another root, which is myeloid root. What is happening in the myeloid root? What they are responsible for? Because already we have seen when uh, hemocytoblast is divided into, lymph, uh, into myeloid root, it leads to the formation of WBC, sorry RBCs and the platelet. Okay. Yet, a part of this myeloid stem cells do form other components of the white blood cells. Okay. So, we will now discuss the second route. So, hemocytoblast to uh, what I will do, I will just pick up another color, so that that will make your life slightly easier to understand. Okay. We have already talked about two routes, where hemocytoblast Okay, let's let's do it like this. This is this is the wrong way to show it. Okay, fine. Uh, here, let's put the myeloid stem cells. Myeloid st stem cells. Okay, from myeloid stem cells, I talked to you that through erythropoietin, something is from RBCs. Okay, this part is all taken care. Okay, then through colony stimulating factor some of the cells are forming platelets. Okay. This part is all done, so we are not going to deal with this part. Now, we will talk about what is happening to the myeloid stem cells, then out here. Okay. So, some of these myeloid stem cells are under the influence of GM and CSF colony stimulating factors to progenitor cells, which are destined to become white blood cells, progenitor cells for WBC white blood cells. Okay. These progenitor cells then divide into two parts, these are called one part, they are they all fall under one part, which are called blast cells. these are called myeloblast, myeloblast. 
Okay. This myeloblast further form three kinds of myelocytes. Okay. These myelocytes then form something called band cells and these band cells form three different white blood cells. One is called basophil, the other in a, one is called eosinophil, third one is called neutrophil. Whereas, there is another root I showed you, there is something which form here is from myoblast, here is from monoblast. This monoblast form thing called pro monocyte and pro monocyte form monocyte. So, this is the other root which is of course, uh, let me just separate it out at this point, this is the demarcation taking place. Okay. This is where the two different cell types are getting separated from here. This is one type, one separation, this is the second separation and this is the second root. So, in sum total, your basophil. So, if you look at it, what are the different kind of white blood cells? Okay. You have basophil, you have eosinophil, you have neutrophil, you have monocyte, which are coming from myeloid lineage and you have lymphocytes, which is coming from lymphoid lineage. So, some in some in some total there are five different kind of WBCs. Now, if you in the light of this information, if you look at the blood chart when the doctor asks you that get me the blood report, they will say eosinophil concentration is higher. Generally, whenever you have persistent sneezing or something, doctor will say, Oh, you are suffering from eosinophilia. What does that mean? That means, your eosinophil cell number has gone up. These eosinophil what you see I which I draw, which is coming from myeloblast and my myelocytes and the band cells. Okay. And if you look under the microscope, how they look like, they look something like this. All these different, now I am talking. So, basophil looks like this. There are lot of, pig, a lot of uh, pigments all over the place. Okay. And if you look at eosinophil, eosinophil cells will look like this, something like this. So, this is eosinophil, this is of course, they have to be put different kind of dyes in order to color them. Okay. Then, if you look at the neutrophil, their sizes are fairly close to each other. Okay. I mean, these are all multinucleated cells. Okay. So, this is called neutrophil. Then you have monocytes, which is more compact kind of you know, this is monocyte and of course, lymphocytes also it is slightly smaller though and like this, which is lymphocyte. Okay. So, coming back. So, if I had to summarize it. So, we talk about uh, hemocytoblast, myeloid origin, uh, hemocytoblast divided into myeloid lineage, lymphoid lineage. Myeloid lineage leads to the formation of RBCs, platelets and basophil, eosinophil, neutrophil, monocyte, which are all clubbed under the category of white blood cells and there is another set of white blood cells, which are of lymphoid origin, which are formed by the from the lymphoid lineage, which are called lymphocytes and lymphocytes are further divided. Okay. What have we will do now? After telling you this, I want you guys to visualize, whenever you heard about somebody has a blood cancer, what really that means. Now, in the light of this whole differentiation, what I highlighted in the bone marrow, what is happening from hemocytoblast. Think of it, how tightly this whole process is regulated. Each cell number has to be right. If it is wrong, then there is a problem. Each cell number has to be, has to be tweaked in such a way, that if something goes bad, 
you may suffer from hemophilia, you may suffer from clotting disorder, you may suffer from anemia, the oxygen or you may suffer from or you may have higher oxygen ca carrying capacity if you are fortunate, okay. then you will be very hyper, okay. hyperactive, you may have more number of uh, more uh, you may be uh, immune compromised, AIDS, okay. you are immune compromised. So, immune compromisation means you have problem with your white blood cells. So, in the light of this whole uh, differentiation process from how from the hemocytoblast this whole differentiation of blood cells is forming all throughout your life within the bone marrow. That may there is enormous research is taking place across the world to understand this process, because this is that zone where lies some of our answer to cancer. Because if you have to understand cancer, this is where we have to hit upon. One of the, of course, related to the blood cancer. This is where it is. Because this whole differentiation is very, very tightly regulated. I mean, like you know, there's one flaw from it is the person suffers. Okay, so that was the sole reason why I took this whole class single, uh, like you know, exclusively to give you in the light of this. When you look at the whole thing, that will make more sense to you than looking them at you know small fragments bits and pieces. So, that is why the blood analysis are is so very important that you know what are you analyzing in the form of blood. That is the sole reason why I just started with your RBCs, talked to you about the clotting and then came to and introduce you to the whole lineage of WBCs, how they are formed and it is from the same cell. So, what regulates? Some of the open ended questions which remain, which are to be answered by mankind is that what it is so unique from the same population of cell, some becomes RBCs, some became neutrophil or some became platelets. Could we? So, the future of tissue engineering, future of differentiation development biology is that, could I pick up any cell, any blood cell or those kind of progenitor cells like hemocytoblast and say, okay, I need more number of platelets or I need more number of RBCs and could he put it back? that is the translational medicine, where it is all heading. Could you do that? That is the future, where it lies. Could we control the differentiation and the development of these different kind of uh, formed elements? And if we could, and how we could? This is where lies some of the very, very challenging questions of next century or this century. As a matter of fact, that could we really do that? Could we cure? Could we uh, cure a patient of blood cancer? That you know, we know do not worry, we can take out a cell or, or there is another way. Could we take any, any kind of stem cells and transform them into blood cells or any other cell type. So, these are some of the very open ended questions, which uh, for which people are striving all over the world. The scientists are working day and night to figure out some of these answers, because it is very easy to see the chart. And, but the fact is physiology is far beyond those charts how really to do that. Yeah, of course, this is only bits and pieces. I mean, if you look at, if you go back to this, go back to this chart, what I was trying to draw and show you guys. Now, think of it, there are so many factors, which are involved, which about which you have no idea, which are really leading to this. What is leading to this? What are the signal? So, that is where lies a lot of unanswered questions out here. Or say for example, here pro erythroblast, erythro, uh, erythroblast, erythroblast, reticulocyte. There are so many factors. What are those factors? And those are happening at a, those are very small molecules. They are expressed for a moment and that is it. They moved out. Okay. How we can control differentiation? These are some of the questions and that is why that whole chart I wish you guys to you know, redraw that chart in a, in a bigger paper. So, that that because, because there is a size and limitations of this screen that I cannot draw everything, unless I am in a blackboard, where I can have the whole end. Okay. So, I want you guys to you know redraw this whole thing, what I have covered now as of now. That will give you a, a kind of understanding, how this whole process is taking place. So, what I will do now, uh, probably in the next class, what I will be doing is that, we will be talking about the function of the different WBCs and we will talk about a little bit about the immunity and a little bit about the RH factor. There are a couple of things, which I have not touched, 
So, let me tell, let me tell you what I will be touching in the next class, I will be talking about the blood groupings. That you, you guys have heard this A plus B plus O and what is blood grouping really, that is one aspect what I am going to touch. Second, I am going to touch about little bit of immunity, third I am going to touch about <coughs> all the uh, all the um, all the different kind of WBCs which are present. So, all the different kind of WBCs, blood grouping and bit of an uh, uh, RH factor, RH positive, RH negative and how that influences the pregnancy. We will talk about all these things and a little bit of immunity and that is where we will close in with this section of blood cells, immunity and clotting. Thanks for your attention.